Hello lads. Today we're going to have a look at diseases and defects. All right, so again, um, we're going to sketch, sketch it out as we're talking through it. Um, I have kind of pre-prepared this one because there's a lot of information in it. There's a lot of sketches that you're going to have to do. So as you're going through the video, pause it as you need to and um, try and get the sketches. Something similar to what I have, um, they don't need to be perfect. So what I want you to do is divide the pages into, or divide the page into three sections if you have an A3 page. If you have A4 pages, you could possibly do one A4 page for each section. So we're going to divide it into natural defects, artificial defects, and finally, we'll have a look at wet and dry rot. All right. So the first thing, um, diseases and defects are obviously not good for the timber. OK, so all these examples that we're going to go through, we're obviously trying to avoid them when we're um, cutting down timber, drying out timber, and even using timber. OK, so we're trying to make sure that we're keeping the timber free of diseases and defects. So the first thing that we're going to have a quick look at, and I'm going to give it a little zoom in on these, and we'll zoom back out. Um, towards the end okay so just so you can you can see clearly hopefully you can read the writing um first thing that we're going to have a look at are knots okay so not knots are really really common um i don't have any timber, don't have any timber here with me so if you have a look at the book here we have an example of a live knot and an example of a dead knot okay so the live knot is the most common example of knots and timber and they're really common so if you examine the timber closely, you'll see lots of examples of live knots. Um, the dead knot, it dries up and shrivels and it eventually falls out. Okay, it comes loose and it falls out. All right. So knots, guys, um, two types, dead and live. Um, I suppose the biggest disadvantage is they weaken the timber. Okay, so the timber has a strength when the grain is running um, along the full length timber. When we have knots, you're going to have holes and you're going to have weak spots in timber okay so it weakens the timber this is i suppose very important when it comes to timber use in structural areas um, for example in building you have different qualities of timber which can be used so if, if you were looking at floor ice or ceiling joists, or even roof or rafters, which are using your ceiling and in your roof, you have different qualities of timber. Okay, so you have R16s and R20. The stronger timber comes with less knots. So you're trying to avoid knots if you're looking for strength in your timber. All right, so that's the first natural defect. Okay, um, I suppose where do knots come from, guys? All right, so knots form when the branches of a tree are cut off or when they fall off. Okay, so when the branch falls off a tree or is cut off, that's where the knot comes from, all right? So you, you can imagine if um, you have the trunk of a tree, similar to this pencil here, you can't see it. If you have a trunk of a tree and if you cut, cut it lengthways into planks, um, that knot from the branch goes deeper into the tree, okay? So that's, that's where it's cut off, all right? So the next thing that we're gonna have a look at is resin pockets, all right? So resin pockets, lads, are small cavities in the wood that are full of resin all right so if you've come across across wood before when you've cut it there was a sticky kind of um, a honey like substance that was stuck onto your hand that's resin all right so these pockets are often hidden from view so they're usually within the tree guys so they're usually within the the trunk of the tree and it's only when you convert the timber into planks that the resin pockets become visible and when you can actually see the resin leaking out of them all right. Again, if you have holes of rise in the timber that's full of resin, which is going to leak out, that's going to weaken the timber again. All right. So again, this will weaken the timber. So these are all natural, guys. There's not really much we can do about these. These are all natural. The next thing we're going to have a quick look at is shakes. Okay. So there's two different types of shakes. There's what we call a radial shake because it happens. Um, within the in view of the trunk and there's a tangential shake okay so the radial shake um, is 
I'm just going to have a quick look at these in the book for you guys because the, the sketch or the drawing is going to be more clear. So the radial shake happens when you're looking at the in view of this here. Okay, so it happens in this direction and then it runs the full length of the tree. So if you can imagine you had this large void within the trunk of a tree and it was running from, um, it could be running 8, 10, 12 feet within the trunk, it's going to weaken the tree considerably. So the first one we have is a heart shake. The second one we have is a star shake because of the shape of it. Again, this tree is really, really weak. Okay, so if you have a void inside here, in this shape, that's taking over a lot of the trunk of the tree is really weak. And the final we have, one we have is a frost shake. Okay, so the frost shake is a result of very harsh weather conditions. And as the name suggests, okay, it's very cold weather conditions. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly sketch in something here, which looks like what we just had in the book. Okay, so a lot of the time, these shakes, the lads, do not um, break the back of the tree, okay? So you don't really see these until you have the tree cut down a lot of the time, okay? So the star shake, again, just the shape of a star. We'll just put that in there. And the last one was the frost shake, okay? So the frost shake was starting in the center, and that one was going out to the outside and was kind of split the tree, okay? So I could get the slice out of it and it kind of split the tree so that you had a large void here. And obviously that's going to weaken the tree an awful lot, okay? So the final two are tangential shakes, all right? So we have what's called the cup shake because it's in the shape of a cup. It follows the grain around, okay? In a semicircular shape, um, if you turn this upside down, you would see that it is in the shape of a cup, okay? Again, it's going to weaken the tree considerably. And the next one we have is a ring shake. Again, this one goes all the way around, so you can see how this would have a really weakening effect on the tree. And it follows the grain of the timber, okay? So both these follow the grain of the timber, all right? Okay, so it's a split, just to clarify that, guys. It's a split within the grain of timber. So your annual growth rings, you're going to have a split between them and a void within there, okay? So again, they're going to really, really weaken the timber, okay? So these are our five, our, our five um, shakes, guys. Three radial at the top, two tangent at the bottom. You just need to be able to identify those, okay? So these um, defects, which we just discussed, they're all natural defects, okay? So what we're going to now have a look at are artificial defects, okay? So the first one is cupping, okay? Um, we've seen cupping already. This example here, if we just zoom out on it. Um, we went through this when we were talking about conversion, okay? So this is an example of true and true sawing. So this is a type of conversion that led to cupping, okay? So cupping, you can see the large, if I put a straight edge along this here, this S square, you can see the large bow or cup within the plank of wood. All right, so that's an example of cupping. Um, it is a man-made defect, all right? It's, it's not a natural defect, it's a man-made defect. Um, the reasons can be, so I'm just gonna put reasons for it down here. It can be the type of conversion. And it can also come from poor stacking. Okay, so when you um, think of uh, when you're stacking timber on top of each other, it has to be good and flat, it has to be even. If you have pressure, if you have this side of the timber underneath supported and the far side supported, there might be a little bit of a cup. But the main um, reason for cupping is the type of conversion, all right? So that's a really big one there. Um, the next one is bowing, or bowing, sorry. So bowing is, I'm just going to. A bio here. I just want to show you the direction of the forces. Okay, so the, the two lips here are coming up. Okay, and we have a cup off. Or we have a little void here in the middle. That's why it's called a cup. The bowing or the bowing is when the ends of the timber is kind of bowing up there. All right, so your bow this time is in the middle of the length of plank of wood. All right. Um, both these guys, cupping and bowing, can be um, as a result of incorrect stacking of the wood. Okay, so this one, type of conversion, 
um, more often than not um, are poor stacking, okay? So this one is usually poor stacking. So just to expand on that a small bit, guys, I just want to run you back to the seasoning and remind you of how we're supposed to stack the wood. Okay, so if you look here, we can see that we have the stickers, which are going across the planks. So we have the planks going this way. Those stickers need to be directly above each other. So you can imagine that this sticker here, it needs to be um, directly underneath the one above it and directly on top of the one below it, okay? All right, so that's the stickers. They need to be in a perfect lineup and the wood also needs to be supported at, um, at a reasonable distance apart from each other, okay? The distance apart from each other will depend on how thick the wood is. The thicker the wood, the further the distance it can be. If the wood is roughly about an inch, it'll need to be supported fairly close to each other. The bowing, guys, is kind of this direction here. All right, so you can imagine the bowing, the reason for it happening is it will be supported along this row, it will be supported along here, but the supports in the middle would not be sufficient. All right. Um, so that's our first two types, coupling and bowing. Third and fourth is twisting and warping. Okay, so again, this can be from poor stacking, Okay, um, it's when two edges of the wood remain straight, but the faces are distorted as if the two ends were twisting in opposite directions. All right, so the two the edges are usually going to remain fairly straight, but it's like you're catching the end here and turning that, and catching the end here and turning it this way. Okay, so kind of a twist or warp. All right. Um, next one is in splitting. We talked about in splitting again, again lads, in. Seasoning, I'm just going to carry you back to that here and show you the sketches from it. All right, so when we were talking about seasoning, we didn't want the ends trying out too quickly. We wanted it to be a similar moisture content throughout the board. So we painted the end to make sure that, that it sealed this year and it didn't dry out quicker than the rest of it. We either painted the end or we put a, a sack cloth over the end. So this cloth is damp and it will stop trying out through the end of the board. All right, so the other one was scaffolding boards. We're not going to really talk about that one. All right, so the in splitting you can see here is when, as a result of poor seasoning, the ends will split. All right, so again, this is poor seasoning. So all these are preventable and all these are man made defects. Okay. It says here that is more common in natural seasoning. Okay, the reason for that is that natural seasoning is um, often not as professional as killing seasoning. So killing seasoning are large companies which are very well educated and I suppose their lads working on this continuous basis. So they would have the incident board sealed, they'd have their sackcloths on. Whereas when it comes to natural seasoning, this night might not always happen. Okay, so a kind of lack of knowledge and just a more professional approach to it in the killing seasoning, which is where it's kind of like a large oven. That's why it's more common in natural seasoning. All right. So case hardening, this is a really interesting one. I touched on it the last thing we were talking about um, seasoning. So Case hardening is when the outsides of the board dry out too quickly, okay? And you end up with a kind of a, a patch in the middle of the board, which is a higher moisture content, all right? So the last thing I tried to compare this to toast, all right? So basically when you put toast into to or bread into the toaster, um, the heat seals the outside, okay? It seals and hardens the outside, and the moisture content will increase in the middle. Okay, so similar to that, that's what happening. That's what's happening here with the case hardening. It dries too fast on the outside. It pushes that moisture moisture in. So the moisture is being pushed into the middle. Okay, from all sides, it's being pushed in, and 
you're going to have a large buildup of a high moisture content in the middle, and it's going to be really dry here in the outsides. Okay, so again, the see the reason for this is seasoning incorrectly and more i suppose it's um it's seasoned too quickly and at too high of a heat okay so the temperature um i'll just pull that down so you can see it. it's seasoned incorrectly it's, it's completed the seasoning is too quick and the temperature is too high all right so it creates um, that little bubble of moisture trapped inside in the center of the bowl. All right. Um, okay, so that's fairly good, lads. Um, we had a good look at six very common types of artificial defects. So again, it's a, as a result of us not um, processing the wood correctly. We've cupping, we've bowing, we've um, are bowing, we've twisting or warping. Or if you refer to this twisting, it's probably easier to remember because it's the wood twisting. We've insplitting. Okay. When we were talking about conversion the last day, also, guys, I just want to show you there was one type of conversion which um, did not split as easy. It was tangential sawn for anyone that remembers that. Okay. So the large advantage of tangential sawn was you have a flared um, grain on the timber, which looks well in furniture. But also, you can see that the flared grain um, reduces the chance of splitting. All right, so you might have you might remember that. Okay, um, the honeycomb cheeks, guys. That's very similar to what we we're talking about back with the resin pockets. Okay, um, it's where uh, there's wood splits within the timber. Okay, so there's splits here in the timber. Um, again, sometimes you may not see this, all right? It could be hidden within a plank, especially if the plank is thick and large. Um, it happens when it dries too quickly and the inside dries before the outside, all right? So kind of the opposite to the, oh, to the case harving. Okay, so dries too quickly. And the opposite to the case hardening, it dries um, in the inside faster than the outside, okay? Have I got room? I'm just gonna write over this. So again, we can link this back to um, when we were having a look at our seasoning. If you think back to the kiln, which you need to know the parts of the steam jets are a massive part of preventing the honeycomb cheeks. Okay, so in here you can see the vites because it's drying in the inside too fast. Um, these steam jets kind of regulate the drying so that that does not happen. All right, so that's a massive um part of the kiln the steam jets are really important and it prevents the honeycomb little vibes from being created so there are artificial defects the next thing that we want to have a quick look at is wet and dry rot all right so both wet and dry rot are fungal attacks okay so they're both um fungal i'll just bring up the book here again to show you because i'm not going to be sketching this out all right so they're both fungal attacks and what happens is the fungi attack the wood, they soften it, and eventually it starts to decay and the, the wet and dry rot kind of eat and feast on the wood, all right? So they make the wood very, very weak, all right? So it's, um, this stuff here looks not too important. The conditions, this is a massive thing here, right? And we're gonna be discussing this for the next few minutes. The conditions for fungal growth, okay? So if you think back to seasoning, the first thing that we were looking to do is we were looking to get the moisture content in the timber down to below 20%. This is the reason that we were looking to get it below 20%. When it's above 20%, it allows um, the fungal growth to, to grow. Okay, so fungal growth, wet and dry rot, need a moisture content of above 20%. So the best way to avoid wet and dry rot is to get your timber down below 20%. All right. Um, 
like I just said, the fungi, they feast on the wood. Okay, so that's their food. And the, they need ox oxygen, particularly warm air. So places that are not well ventilated, if you think of older houses, the attics, places like that, which are very poorly ventilated, they have warm, stale air. Um, the fungi absolutely love those conditions. Okay, so it's fungal growth. Um, the conditions are moisture content above 20%. Okay. Um, stale warm air. Okay, they absolutely love those conditions and they feast on the food, as we said, all right? So just from that small bit of information, all right, you, you don't need to um, have too much, uh, thought, uh, you don't need to put too much thought into this. So if there are the conditions where the fungi grow and they thrive, obviously the treatment is going to try uh, to be to take this away. So the treatment is to have your timber below 20% moisture content, Okay, that's the first thing, okay. The second thing is because timber is a hydroscopic material, remember that word, hydroscopic? That's where if, if timber is exposed to a lot of water, it's gonna soak that water up and the moisture content's gonna go up, okay? So wet and dry rot happens a lot where there's leaks and where there's water ingress, especially through places like roofs where gutters might be broken, where the felt might be broken, a slate might be broken. Um, so what we're looking to do is we're looking to take away any leaks, okay? Um, so we're looking to stop excess water coming in. So stop leaks um, and stop any excess, wa excess water ingress. Okay, so any leaks in your roof any leaks around your windows, anywhere there's water getting in, and where the water, as a result, um, pushes that moisture content in the timber up above 20%, you're gonna have um, wet or dry rot. So what you're looking to do is to stop any leaks, all right? So in old buildings, lads, um, especially ones that are derelict and you can see that they've partially collapsed, the reason that they collapse is that they have timber lintels. So over the windows, where the where the, the holes are for the win windows, they might have timber lintels, they'll have timber in their roofs. So leaks start to get in. Um, the timber starts to take on water. So the timber moisture content goes from 20, might go up to 40, 50. Once it's up there, the wet or possibly dry rot if it's inside will start attacking the wood and start feasting on the wood. Um, as it's feasting on the wood, the longer it goes on, the weaker the wood gets and eventually the wood, the structure, the stability of the wood goes down and the roof might collapse in, the lintels above the windows, which are holding up the blocks or stone work above the windows, they might collapse and the whole thing will start to cave in on it. So wet and dry rot is a massive reason for that, okay? Um, so the next thing that we're gonna have a look at is, is there anything else? about wet and dry rot, no. So I have a few pictures actually guys that you might want to see for wet and dry rot. Just um, if you see it around, so you're gonna see this, these two funguses as they're all around you, all right? So if you go outside, if you have um, like in, fences outside, posts, window frames, logs, doors, even firewood, any wood that's exposed to really wet conditions that maybe it's on the ground, the wet, the wet part of the ground, you're gonna see wet rot hitting it, especially if it's not ventilated. Okay, if it's ventilated, it may not be there. If it's not ventilated and if it's wet conditions, eventually wet rot will hit it. The dry rot is often inside. Okay, so you'll see a lot of dry rot inside in houses, especially in attics, um, roof trusses or roof joists or roof rafters, sorry, and places like that. The dry rot often looks like uh, the timber has been kind of burned. Okay, so the timber will be breaking up into these rectangular shapes and you can see that it even looks weaker, okay? So I have another picture here of a roof where the rafters um, dry rot. So there was water and lack of ventilation, all right? So this is an old, this came from an old house where the felt and the slates were, I suppose, damaged. The water got in, okay? When the water got in, the moisture content in this went up above 20%. 
because it's an old house, there's no ventilation in the attic. So it's a warm, stale environment. The air is very warm and stale and the dry rot hit this. Okay, so if you wanted to prevent the dry rot, you either stop the leaks coming in and you increase ventilation. Okay, so anything with wood and even um, woodworms, things like that, if you increase the ventilation and stop the moisture content being high, it'll go a long way towards um, stopping, stopping the, the wet or dry rot, okay? So yeah, so that's that'll give you a good idea of that. If you wanna learn a little bit more about it, there is more information in your book. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail because I don't want to overload you with information, okay? So the last thing that we're gonna have a look at is woodworm, all right? So woodworm is an insect attack, all right? So this was a fungal attack. Woodworm is an insect attack. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to show you this in the book again. All right. So with the insect, right, there is kind of a life cycle in the insect. And we're just going to have a fast look at that. The first thing is an adult is going to, um, an adult insect is going to get into the wood. It's a wood boring insect. Okay. When it finds a little crevice or a hole um, or a weakness in the wood, okay, which may be caused from wet or dry rot, it may not, but maybe it lays its eggs inside her. After a little while, the eggs hatch into um, a worm or larva. All right, it's going to stay in the wood and it's going to feast on that wood. All right. After a while, again, it develops into pupa. Um, it gets the shell, it eats again, and it pushes towards the surface of the wood. Once it reaches um, the stage where it's near an adult, it's going to push up towards the, the surface of the wood, creating an extra bite or a hole, and the whole cycle starts again. It becomes an adult, egg, larva, and that just continuously works around. All right. Um, okay. So the attack and feed in the timber. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the life cycle of it. All right. Um, there's a few different types. Again, I don't want to go into this in too much detail because look, you're not going to need to know a lot of this stuff. That's the larva beetle. This is their tiny little creatures. Lads. And when you see the wood with woodworm holes, you literally, um, you're obviously, you're, sometimes you won't see these because they're so small. Okay. So it grows between four and six millimeters. All right. So if you think of four millimeters, lads, it's a tiny, tiny little woodworm insect. Um, the wood, when it's after being attacked by a woodworm, it's going to have all these small little holes in it, okay? Like cheese or something like that. It's like little air pockets. This is where the eggs were laid, the eggs were hatching, and the insect is feasting on the wood, all right? So that's what the wood is going to look like. Um, again, the treatment for woodworm, okay, is it can be sprays. So it can be sprays. They love um, timber with a high moisture content. A high moisture content and again, like stale warm conditions. Okay, so very similar to, the conditions are very similar to wet and dry rot. All right. Um, so insecticides guys, that's what you use to spray it. Um, you spray the whole surface of the wood and that's just used to kill, kill off the kill off the insects, all right? So that's about the size of it. Take your time when you're going through this, or sorry, it's you're at the end of the video now, so you're probably going through it. Um, yeah, there's a good little bit in it. And we'll just bring it out here to show what your finished sheet should look like. Okay, so it should look like something similar to what I have, all right? So that's disease and defects covered, lads. Thanks very much.